In this movie, I'll introduce the basic vocabulary of rotation. The process will likely remind you of the one we went through at the beginning of the year when we described linear motion. The key difference is that the letters have changed, and I guess the meanings have changed slightly as well, but there are always um, connections to be made to linear motion, so sh you should really be looking for those as we go through this movie. So first of all, when you think about rotation, um, the only way you can really talk about rotation effectively is, to is to define what the axis of rotation is. And so on the particular example that I just showed you, it's this point here that basically is the one point on the cat head that doesn't move when I rotate it. So there it is. And um, if you think I'm just playing a visual trick or something like that, we can move the point over so that it's at a place that isn't the axis of rotation. And you can see when I rotate the cat head around again, that, that point really does move. So the axis of rotation is the only place that doesn't move on the object. If I move the axis of rotation a little bit to be closer to the nose, I can rotate the cat ar around again. And so you can choose lots of different axes of rotation. It doesn't have, they don't all have to be in the same place. And in fact, um, and, and importantly, uh, the axis of rotation doesn't have to be right at the middle of the object. And in fact, the axis of rotation can even be outside of the object. So here's an example of an axis of rotation that's completely outside of the cat's head. So uh, now that we have an idea of the axis of rotation in place, we can start defining some other terms. So what would be some of the other terms we might want to define? Well, we talked about position when we talked about linear motion. So what would position angle mean in terms of rotational motion? Well, the first thing we have to do is define a zero point. So let's call this angle zero. And if we rotate the cat head through some angle theta, that will be the position angle. And you should know that the convention is to call um, counterclock angles that are counterclockwise from the zero position angle positive. And so in this case, we have rotated the cat's head through a negative position angle. But in, in any event, the symbol we use for that is theta. And um, that's the basic idea of the position angle. How about angular displacement? Well, think back to linear motion. What was displacement about when we talked about linear motion? It was really about a change in position. So we can change the position angle like this and um, call this the final and this the initial. And the change in position angle is theta f minus theta i. And that also is known as angular displacement. Uh, what else did we define when we were talking about linear motion? Well, we defined velocity, right? So what would angular velocity look like? Well, you might not be surprised to hear that the average angular velocity is going to be the change in theta over change in time. So you can just figure out how far that, how, how much angle that cat head passes through in a certain period of time. Divide delta theta by delta t and you'll get average angular velocity. And that that W is uh, a Greek letter called omega. If you want the instantaneous velocity, you take the limit as delta t approaches zero of delta theta over delta t, also known as d theta by dt. Or in other words, you just take the derivative of theta with respect to time. Um, angular acceleration uh, can similarly be defined. So uh, the letter we use for angular acceleration is alpha. So the average angular acceleration is going to be delta omega over delta t. And if you want the instantaneous angular acceleration, that's the limit as delta t approaches zero of delta omega over delta t. Or you can write it as a derivative, d omega by dt. But don't forget that you can get omega instantaneous angular velocity by taking the derivative of theta with respect to time. So if you take the second derivative of theta with respect to time, that will be the angular acceleration, instantaneous angular acceleration. So what's the connection between the translational motion of a single point and the rotational motion of an extended object? Here's a point on the cat's head. Um, I'm going to leave the axis of rotation on the eye of the cat. And if I rotate the cat's head through some angle theta, I can also define the, um, the arc length or, uh, yeah, the arc length that the 
point passes through as s. And of course the radius is the distance um, from the axis of rotation to that point. And if theta is measured in radians, then there's a simple relationship between theta, r, and s. And this is the relationship. And this is just the definition um, of radian measure, really. Um, and so as long as theta is measured in radians, it will be true that s is equal to r theta. So that's nice, um, and it turns out that if you take the derivative of this equation, then um, you some nice things happen. So what would the derivative of s with respect to time be? Well, that's really derivative of position with respect to time, and so that's going to be the speed. And the derivative of theta with respect to time, we've just learned, is omega. And so we get that the linear speed of that point will be equal to r times omega. Now let's take the derivative of both sides again. And on the right hand side, sorry, on the left hand side we'll have dv by dt. On the right hand side we'll have r times d omega by dt. The left hand side will turn into acceleration, but we need to be careful. That is acceleration sub t. And the right hand side is going to be equal to r times alpha. Now that's a tangential acceleration, um, meaning that this is an acceleration that really tells us about the change in the speed of the object. And of course that we can also um, talk about centripetal acceleration. And you probably remember that the centripetal acceleration is uh, equal to v squared over r. And so if you are looking at that particular point and um, you want to find out what is it ex its, its acceleration, you have to make two calculations, one to get a tangential acceleration that will be along the direction of the motion and tell you about the change in speed, and uh, you'll have to also calculate the centripetal acceleration, which is perpendicular to the direction of motion. Um, and there's one other substitution that you can make there that um, I don't have in here, but I should. And that is that, of course, v squared is equal to r omega. And so if you make that substitution, you'll find that the centripetal acceleration is omega squared r. So that might be worth writing down. All right, so now that we have defined our terms, um, as we did when we talked about linear motion, we might like to see if there's a set of equations that will deal with the special case where the angular acceleration of an object is constant. And you should think back to your experience with linear motion. And we had a set of equations that we used when acceleration was constant. And um, you might not be surprised to see that the ones we have for um, angular motion look very, very similar to those equations that you are familiar with. If you take the old equations and replace a with alpha and v with omega and uh, x with theta, you'll have these equations. Um, but it might be nice to know where they come from, and it doesn't hurt to review. So we can start with average acceleration is change in omega over change in time, and rearrange that equation to, um, well, not rearrange it, and, and note that if the um, acceleration is constant, then the average acceleration is equal to the instantaneous acceleration is equal to the acceleration. So we'll just call it alpha. And rearrange that a little bit, and what you find is that omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha times delta t. Um, really the substitution that's being made there is that change in omega is omega final minus omega initial, and then you rearrange the equation and you can get this one. So uh, also remember that if something has a constant acceleration, then the, the uh, graph of omega versus time should be a straight line. It could be downward sloping, could be upward sloping, it could have uh, a horizontal slope, but um, anyway, the, the plot should be a straight line. And so um, if we look at uh, two different, if we, if we look at two different omegas that are separated in time by delta t, um, we can convince ourselves that the area under this curve should be the change in theta.
And um, the area under that curve, well, that's just a trapezoid. So that's one half omega zero plus omega final times delta t. Um, so that gives us the fourth equation up above and, and the omega f equals omega zero plus alpha delta t is the second equation above. And you might remember um, how to derive the other two. What we did early in the year was we solved, um, we made substitutions. So you could take, for example, omega f equals omega zero plus alpha delta t uh, and plug in for omega f in the equation below, omega zero plus alpha delta t, rearrange, and you'll get one of the other equations. And so you just start making substitutions and you can find the other two equations. Um, and I would recommend that you try that.